getting started. So welcome to whatever number class this is in our <laughs> final course on Shanti Deva's text. I think it'll be coming up on the screen when I do share uh, the slides, but let's go ahead and start with the prayers that we normally do. And as we recite this praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, we're thinking about how the Buddha has fulfilled all of his own qualities, his own welfare, developed himself completely. And then moreover, he's in the perfect position to benefit ourselves and all beings. And we too can accomplish these same results. And that's what we're aiming for in being here tonight. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan. I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. I'm going to do the short mandala offering. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niriyata Yami. And finally, refuge in Bodhicitta before the teaching, uh, first in English and then the other two times in Tibetan. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chodang soki choknam la jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki chanyan gi pe sanam gi dola penchir sangye drupar sho sangye chodang soki choknam la jang chu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki Chanyan gi pe sanam gi dola penchir sangye du parsho. All right. And a short meditation as usual, just to focus our minds a bit before we begin the class. So spend a few minutes focusing on the breath, uh, making your mind as uh, attentive to the breath as you can without any distraction. And whenever the mind does get distracted, gently guide the mind back to the breath. Do this for a few minutes in silence, and then I'll come in and lead you in a short reflection to set our motivation for tonight.
So now let's set our motivation for tonight. I thought I would share some of what Rinpoche says. While I was on retreat, I listened to a number of Rinpoche's teachings from Nepal. And he emphasized so much this idea of needing to let go of this life. Make sure that we don't get consumed with the happiness of this life. I thought we would use this as a way of setting our motivation tonight. You know, if we do get kind of completely caught up in this life, and we don't do what we can with this life in terms of at least creating the causes for another good rebirth, perhaps even creating the causes for our own liberation, but moreover, creating the causes for our own enlightenment, and therefore the enlightenment of all beings, we really will have wasted this life. This life that we worked so hard to get, the karma that we created in the past that have given us this perfect opportunity that is just completely ideal for us to practice the Dharma. We've met with the Mahayana teachings. We've met with incredible gurus. And it would be a shame if we didn't take advantage of this to the greatest degree. Rinpoche often points out the analogy of someone going to an island where there are just many jewels all there for the taking. And yet that person leaves the island empty handed without having gotten even one single jewel from that island. All the jewels that we want to get from this island of this human rebirth are again to at least work with the motivation of letting go of our attachment to this life and setting our sights on a good rebirth doing everything we can to create as much virtue as possible so that when we die we can be assured that we'll have another opportunity as rich as this one but also to set our sights on the more far-reaching goals the more definite forms of happiness our own liberation our freedom from our own suffering once and for all and of course the greater goal where we dedicate ourselves to the welfare of all beings and strive to achieve enlightenment to create the causes as best as we can in this lifetime to be able to accomplish that result as quickly as possible if not in this lifetime then as soon as possible in a future lifetime so it all begins with setting our sights on these goals and if we have the greatest goal in mind, Rinpoche says, then all the others will be taken care of. If we think that we are here dedicated to achieving enlightenment for the sake of all beings, we will be assured of our own liberation. We will be assured of good rebirths. We will even be assured of happiness in this life. This is the most far-reaching motivation, and it's the way to assure that we don't leave this life empty-handed, that we make sure that we have created the causes for our own ultimate welfare, as well as the welfare of all sentient beings. And we dedicate this time we have together with that motivation. And in this way, make the best use of this human rebirth. Okay, so we are resuming our study of chapter nine that will go on for uh, the rest of this month. And in the last session, I imagine we'll maybe be close to finishing chapter nine or we'll have finished it so we can read chapter 10 together as a way of dedicating all this time that we spent together. I, don't, I didn't count up the hours. I don't know how many hours we've spent together studying this text. But uh, anyway, we'll do that at the tail end of this. Right now, we're in the section of chapter nine that we started uh, the last time that have, has to do with realizing selflessness of phenomena. Chapter nine, again, is on the perfection of wisdom. And initially we went looked through the two truths and a number of other topics. And we went on to look at how we actually discern selflessness, beginning with the person, because this is how we actually realize selflessness, is first looking at this I that we are so caught up in that is at the root of all of our problems, this view of this transitory collection, uh, holding on to this I that is merely labeled as being real, as having greater substance. And uh, so we looked at 
at that. And then in the chapter on um, selflessness of phenomena, because the Buddha didn't only teach that the I doesn't exist in this way, he taught that all phenomena don't exist in this way. We went on then to, which what session was this? Session five? Are we really at five? Oh, it's hard to believe. <laughs> okay. Um, we went through explaining the selflessness of phenomena in terms of first the um, uh, the close placements of mindfulness. Uh, these were again on the body, feelings, uh, mind, and phenomena, kind of discerning that all these phenomena that are involved in the basis of a person also lack any inherent existence. Then there was a, a section that began on page 59 that had to do with refuting the argument that the two truths would be non-valid uh, from verses 106 to 115. This is what we covered the last time. It was just the idea that with this positing uh, emptiness of inherent existence, we're in no way refuting that things exist conventionally. And so therefore we can uphold conventional truth, which are things that are merely labeled, uh, merely designated by mind, and then their emptiness. And these are two, again, are always together. We talked about this uh, months ago when we went into the first subject on the two truths. But when we refute inherent existence, of course, for the lower schools, they think that this means we're refuting utter existence uh, because they equate the two. So again, this is uh, how we had to come back and reestablish that the two truths are completely valid within this framework of the emptiness of inherent existence. So let me just check in to see were there any questions from the discussion tonight or anything that uh, if, if, it, if it's not too much time, but let's see what Snae has. Yes, please. Oh, so in our discussion group, Gendon, we were um, talking about the three criteria for valid existence. Mm -hmm. And two things came out of it. Uh, one was, you know, the last criteria. Um, we were not sure what the gist of that is, like what it's really pointing at. Right. Um, and we were, I was look, we were looking at practicing wisdom. I think it's page one thirty four. Okay. Yeah. That, was, that. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One thirty three. It's the first second paragraph of one thirty three. Mm -hmm. And it says, and the third states that conventional realities cannot be negated by analysis into the ultimate nature. Mm -hmm. So, so again, what we're what we're establishing there is that is that when you have when somebody is establishing, let's go through all three of them, and we'll we'll discern again. The first one is that that things and events are validly established by valid experience or convention, that there's, this is just what the world agrees upon that is established. That's the first criterion that is needed in terms of establishing that something can be a conventional truth. The second states that the truth of their existence cannot be contravened by valid experiences. So this is referring to the fact that then you have a, another conventional awareness that could refute what you potentially believe to be conventional reality. Conventionalities have to be upheld by other conventional valid cognition. So if, if you have one, uh, uh, like if there was some spiritual tradition that was saying something didn't exist, if another tradition was able to posit that it did exist through valid cognition, then that would refute the conventional awareness of that other spiritual group. And so that's the idea behind the second one. The third one is getting at the fact that even in the face of an ultimate valid cognition, that conventional nature obviously can't be up, upheld if it doesn't actually exist. This would be in reference to things that are being held to exist uh, inherently. So when we are apprehending objects, all of us with ignorance, our minds still veiled by ignorance, we are apprehending them together with an overlay and an appearance of, of inherent existence. So we are believing in that and affirming to that within the sphere of our establishing conventionalities. That layer can also be removed by the ultimate valid cognition. You have one layer that can be removed by conventional valid cognition, which is just whether things exist in a conventional nature, but then you have another one that can be removed by an ultimate valid awareness, which would be again, the mind discerning emptiness of inherent existence refutes that you have an inherently existent I or an inherently existent computer or an inherently existent whatever. So a, a conventional valid cognition is able to uphold uh, some level of truth of things in terms of their conventional nature, but it doesn't, it isn't able to uphold them as inherently existent because that would be refuted by an ultimate valid cognition. 
So the wording on here is a little strange. It says the third states that conventional realities cannot be negated by analysis into their ultimate nature, meaning that that in the end, when what we can posit as a conventional reality can't be anything that's inherently existent because that's what's neg negated by uh, an ultimate valid cognition. That's the only thing that would be negated by that. We would still be able to uphold that everything else exists, but again, it doesn't exist with any inherent existence. So that's the reasoning why that third one is thrown in there, because you have to be able to also refute that uh, an inherently existent I exists. You're that getting, makes sense. Making, okay, good. Yeah. And then the, yeah, go ahead. And then the other thing that was very puzzling to us that came mm -hmm. out of our discussion of the first two um, valid establishments of conventional existence is, you know, how do we apply this in our practical life? Like it made sense to us the first and second criteria when we want to say, okay, this is a mirage and that water won't quench your thirst, but this is real water, it will quench your thirst, like for those examples. But what happens when we have examples like, is arranged marriage acceptable or not? And you have a whole group of people who will say, yes, it is acceptable. And all of these people agree with me. And then a whole group of here saying, no, arranged marriages are awful for women. And there's a whole group of people who will agree with them. So it satisfies both criteria, but they're both mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, there are going to be some things in the world, I suppose, that we're never going to find like absolute agreement that there is uh, one way of looking at it conventionally as valid. But I think we're getting at deeper issues here than than something like that. Again, I mean, I'm not saying that that's not an important issue, but I think we're getting at, at, at how we establish things as existing. Well, I mean, if we looked at just arranged marriages, arranged marriages exist. They are posited by conventional people. They aren't contravened by other co conventional valid cognition. They aren't even contravened by uh, ultimate valid cognition when we talk about them as being merely imputed. As to their, their merit or their value or their virtue or non-virtue, that would be a whole nother discussion. And again, uh, we would probably have to rely when we get into some of these things that, that are deeper issues um, as to what is the, the ram what are the ramifications of an arranged marriage in terms of karmically or something like that, then you would have again probably to rely upon uh, other wisdom that is not necessarily going to be part of the back and forth that goes on in convention the conventional world. <laughs> the conventional world will manage to agree or disagree with various things. So we could look at the issue of abortion right now being you know debated in the Supreme Court, um, and in a in a uh, karmic sense abortion is killing i mean that's how it's posited within you know that that is a, a consciousness that has entered into that um, fetus and when one is taking the life of that regardless of what's going on we can say that it is the killing of a sentient being but you know in the world at large we have a general agreement at least within the united states at the current time that abortion is an acceptable thing to have as legally protected and for people to be able to engage in that so again, you're always going to have worldly debate over various things, but if you want to you know, go down to a deeper level and say, well, what are the karmic ramifications of that? Well, then you have to rely upon something beyond worldly wisdom because worldly wisdom isn't necessarily going to be accurate in regard to that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, these get to be tough, tough things that yeah. I, I don't know that you can say that there's there's one way to establish valid cognition with regard to a conventional awareness when you have these polar opposite views that go on in our society. Yeah, but I was struck by a comment, by the comment you made at the beginning of this, which is that the, the, the reason for these criteria is not to get into the worldly debate, but it's like pointing us at something deeper, you mm -hmm. know, about making us think about whether it exists or not. Like that is more what it's, it's more foundational in that respect. Everything else, like you said, is up for grabs. I think so, because even if you talk about tonight, we aren't going to, we, if we get that far, we'll get into the whole idea of Ishvara, this creator God that is established by some of these Hindu traditions, Vedic traditions. And, um, you know, that would be a point of contention between the, theistic traditions and non-theistic traditions. And Buddhism would say that there is no valid basis for this being that they're referring to as God, a creator God, Ishvara, whatever the case might be. But you're always going to have that kind of debate going on. I guess it's not, 
it's relevant in terms of when it comes down to if we are Buddhists and adhering to Buddhist philosophy and the Buddhist teachings, and we need to use Buddhist criteria for defining what these things are and following these um, in terms of our own practice and, and uh, how Buddhism plays out for us. But in terms of debate with the world, you're probably never going to win because there's um, a preponderance of people in this world who believe in a god who have a theistic bent. So, you know, <laughs> these things, are, again, are not going to be as useful in that worldly structure to be debating about as they are for our own personal um, endeavors and our own spiritual practice. If we keep putting the onus on a creator god as to what we are experiencing, well, then we never take personal responsibility for what we are creating with our own lives. And that's the rationale behind, you know, moving away from that concept. As Venerable Rabina often points out, it's not that you know Buddha has some thing against a, a god. He's, there's, just, there's no room for the, a, a creator god and a Buddhist way of looking at things. Buddhist philosophy doesn't have any way of kind of putting that in as a factor, as we're going to see when we get to that debate tonight. So I don't know. I don't know if I've answered your question sufficiently. But... Yeah, I think you took away some of the angst around that that uh -huh. it could possibly have. It's that it's not valid in, in the ways we're looking for it to be valid. It's valid maybe at the deeper levels of when we're talking about, you know, what establishes existence, like just that basic idea more. I, think I mean, so. I have to think about it, but yeah. 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 Good question. So, <laughs> yeah, because I think that, again, the, the whole thing is to apply it to our own practice and our own experience of the world and to recognize that we're on a quest for truth, essentially, and trying to find what is truth. And that, of course, entails ultimate truth is the main subject we're looking at in this um, chapter. But nonetheless, conventional truth needs to be a part of that equation, because it is conventional truth that possesses that ultimate truth. You always have the two hand in hand. So again, we we might you know see that as, we, as our knowledge grows of ultimate truth, we'll have a greater knowledge of what conventional truth really is as well. But maybe not to get too caught up again into the arguments of the world because they're all generally rooted in an ignorance that is grasping at inherent existence anyway. So I don't know. Let's go ahead and get started because I want to make sure we get through a fair amount of material for uh, through tonight. So let me pull back up the slides and we can get back into the text where we're at. Now we're moving into the section that begins on page 63 of Geltsup J's commentary on chapter nine. And this is stating the reasons that establish the lack of true existence. So this is a rather lengthy section where we get into a number of other reasonings. We've already looked at uh, some of the reasonings around um, uh, establishing emptiness. The very first one that we're going to go into in this outline is called the Vajra sliver reason. You often uh, hear it referred to as the diamond slivers. And the idea is, is that even a sliver of a diamond is still a diamond. When we, you know, we're able, if you're able to shatter a diamond into many slivers, they all still retain their diamondness within those. And so it's kind of the indestructible nature of emptiness with regard to all these things. This is all from, uh, well, at least most of this is going to be from the handout that I had distributed at the very beginning of this second part of chapter nine. Um, but again, these will all be in the slides when you get them. Uh, it says Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle way begins with an analysis of production that mainly refutes the inherent existence of products other than persons. So again, we're in that selflessness of phenomena. And here we're going to be analyzing in terms of production. So we're looking at impermanent phenomena, caused phenomena, conditioned phenomena, those things that arise from their respective causes. And so these are produced phenomena. In the treatise, it says, and in Chandrakirti's supplement to Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle way, the diamond slivers or fragments, splinters, etc., are the main means for approaching the absence of true production. So let's take a look at this more and then we'll talk about it a little bit. The diamond slivers are so-called because each is a powerful means of destroying the conception of inherent existence. Each of them is kind of powerful in their own right. Just like, again, that uh, diamonds, uh, it remains uh, a diamond even when it is uh, you know, down into slivers or fragments. The reasoning is composed of a thesis. We talked about thesis and uh, reasons before. The subjects, things, are not inherently produced. So that's a subject and a predicate. Uh, things are not inherently produced. And then you'd ask why. You have a four-cornered proof for this. Because of not being produced from themselves, from naturally existent others, 
from both or causelessly. So essentially it's not being produced from self, from something that is inherently other, from both self and other, or without any cause. So we're going to, by going through each of these four, you essentially refute inherent production. So these four reasons are themselves each theses, which are non-affirming negatives. They do not imply anything positive in their place, such as the existence of no production from self. Still, they do imply another non-affirming negative that things are not inherently produced. Because although non-affirming negatives lack positive implications, they can imply other non-affirming negatives of the same type. So there's a lot of words in this. And I thought, I actually realized I didn't put anything in that handout about non-affirming negatives. And we may have touched on it here and there in this course, but I think it's really important to talk about them a bit. So I went to the back of Jeffrey Hopkins' Meditation on Emptiness. I remembered that there was a wonderful appendix there on the around page 720 or so is where it starts. And here he goes into negatives in Buddhism, because we can divide all phenomena that exist into positive phenomena and negative phenomena. And that is mutually inclusive. You know, you don't, if something, uh, you know, is existing, it is either one or the other. It's a dichotomy. So the formal definition of an affirming negative, let's start with that, a positive phenomena uh, that is, I'm sorry, a negative that is affirming. Because within negative, you have affirming negatives, and you have non-affirming negatives. Positive phenomena are things like a, a tree, a pot, a, a book, a person. Those are all affirming um, positive phenomena. Affirming negative phenomena are essentially phenomena that are where you're negating something, but in the place of what you are negating, you are affirming something. So let's look at how this is described by Jeffrey Hopkins. A negative which is such that the term expressing it suggests in place of the negation of its own object of negation, another positive phenomenon, which is its own object of suggestion. So in place of something being negated, something else is being suggested. You know, it's kind of maybe a little bit in, politically incorrect to use this example, but it's used in the text all the time that the, the rather overweight uh, Devadatta doesn't eat during the day. This is a affirming negative. Why? Because you are suggesting that this rather overweight Devadatta must be eating in the night, because if he's overweight, he must be eating sometime and he doesn't eat during the day. So by saying a negative phenomenon, that he doesn't eat during the day, you are implying or inferring a positive phenomenon that he does eat during the night. So this is one way that affirming negatives are established. Again, there are two types of negatives. We have positive phenomena over here, and those are all the things that we normally relate to. But negative phenomena do exist. This is the first way that they exist, is as these affirmations within the negation. So while something is being negated, something else is either being uh, explicitly or implicitly applied or uh, implied, or um, perhaps both. <laughs> so let's take a look at the remainder of the description here. You can read more on this, by the way. I didn't go into the whole detail on all four types of these, but there are four types of affirming negatives, depending on how the terms that express them suggest positive phenomena in, their, in place of their negatives, either explicit, explicitly, implicitly, both, or by context. So for example, the Devadatta one that I just used is not one that does it implicitly. It implies that uh, Devadatta must eat during the night if he is uh, rather overweight and that way he would, uh, you know, um, that would account for his being overweight if he doesn't eat during the day. An affirming negative that is explicitly uh, affirming something is a mountainless plain, for example, a plain on which there are no mountains. The term eliminates mountains, Jeffrey Hopkins says, but openly speaks of a plain. Thus, a mountainless plain is an affirming negative which explicitly suggests or reveals a positive phenomenon. So you are affirming a plain and just saying that it is mountainless, that there are no mountains on that plain. So again, these are the other two I'm not going to go into, but in all four of these cases, Jeffrey Hopkins says, something is suggested in place of the negation of the object of negation. However, with a non-affirming negative, the other type of negative, nothing positive is suggested. Only an object of negation is negated. Nevertheless, a non-affirming negative is an object, an existent, a phenomenon, and so on. 
I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know emphasis on negation, of course, when you get into emptiness, because we are negating inherent existence. And the whole idea behind this is that by negating inherent existence, we are not in any way suggesting some other mode of existence. Although things do have a mode of existence that can be posited within the understanding of emptiness, that is not what is being implicitly, explicitly, whatever, being affirmed by the mere negation of inherent existence. So this is what's being talked about here in terms of uh, this whole idea of what the diamond slivers or the Vajra slivers are getting us to is this non-affirming ne negation. Let's look at how Jeffrey Hopkins just uh, puts a forth a definition for that. This is a negative which is such that the term expressing it does not suggest in place of the negation of its own object of negation, another positive phenomenon, which is its own object of suggestion. So the other one did suggest another object, a positive object, but this one doesn't. For example, the non-existence of the horns of a rabbit is expressed by the sentence, the horns of a rabbit do not exist. And this does not suggest anything positive in place of the horns of a rabbit. It doesn't suggest that those are actually ears that you're seeing and not horns. It doesn't suggest anything. It's just a mere negation of horns of a rabbit. This is actually used very frequently in Buddhist um, debate and what have you to talk about a non-existent. They often use the idea of the, non the horns of a rabbit as something that doesn't exist. Another example is the child of a barren woman. So if a, bar a woman is barren from birth, is incapable of uh, ever producing any offspring, then she can't have a child, of course, meaning a natural child. You can obviously adopt or what have you. But, but the idea is that these are examples of non-existence. So when we have something that is a negation, then the negation of or non-existence of the horns of a rabbit, it doesn't suggest anything positive in place of those horns. Though it can suggest another non-affirming negative, such as the non-existence of the beauty of the horns of a rabbit, or the texture of the horns of a rabbit, or whatever qualities you might want to ascribe to something that doesn't exist, it doesn't suggest any positive phenomenon in place of its object of negation. So again, it, it is merely a pure negation, the non-existence of the horns of a rabbit. This, this is <laughs> a picture. I used something very similar to this to take over to uh, Italy to show the Geshe over there, who was really stunned by this. He, he said, no, there are horns of a rabbit, I guess. <laughs> but this is a, obviously a doctored up photo of a jackalope. But <laughs> I, I couldn't help but share that. So in this same vein, an emptiness merely eliminates inherent existence. It does not imply anything positive in its place. Though emptiness is compatible with conventional existence, meaning con existence in dependence upon causes and conditions, parts, mere imputation, it does not suggest conventional existence in place of its object of negation. It is negating inherent existence, and that is all that it is doing. It's a mere negation uh, in a non-affirming way. Still, it is stressed that a proper understanding of emptiness acts to assist an understanding of conventional existence. And emptiness is the mere elimination of inherent or objective existence, and thus is a mere negative, a non-affirming negative, a mere absence of its object of negation. So again, you can contemplate this a bit. Uh, there still might be questions that you might have about this idea of a non-affirming negative. But this is what we are trying to arrive at, is a mere absence, a mere negation that we are understanding initially conceptually, and that we then come to eventually understand in a non-conceptual way through a direct realization of emptiness. But when we arrive at that place, there shouldn't be any sort of residual stuff that is being held in the mind. It's not like, again, when we use the reasoning of dependent arising to get to emptiness, we're still trying to not uh, kind of uphold some affirmation of that within the sphere of understanding emptiness, and that we then, you know, have emptiness leading us into that way that things exist conventionally. Rather, the idea is, is that that points in the direction of this non-existence of inherent existence. And when we get to that place where we realize that, that negation, that's what we want to single pointedly focus on. It's, it's a mere negation. There's nothing else that is appearing, nothing else that is being affirmed at that time. 
So it's an important point because otherwise we are still dealing with some level of uh, conventional um, phenomena that are being implied in the face of, of what we are trying to realize as emptiness. And emptiness does uphold dependent arising and empty, dependent arising upholds emptiness. But that's not the conclusion we are coming to by understanding emptiness. The conclusion we're coming to is the mere negation, the uh, final sort of uh, nail in the coffin, an inherent existence. So let's continue with what was in the handout that you had about back going back to the diamond slivers. The reasoning which proves that things are not inherently produced, which is what the diamond slivers are about, does not establish that things are nominally or conventionally produced, you know, through mere designation and so on. The diamond slivers are non-affirming negatives and just the absence of inherently existent production, not the presence of nominal production, is realized when inferring or directly cognizing the emptiness of production. So again, we're trying to arrive at that mere negation, not to uh, get to an, aff an aff affirmation of nominal production. That's not the point of this reasoning. It's to drive us to that mere negation. The four negative theses do serve as proofs of another thesis that things are not inherently produced and thus their import can be stated syllogistically as we did above, right? Things are not produced uh, inherently. Why? Because of these four, this fourfold proof uh, that in the end refutes uh, inherent production. The reason why no more than four negative theses are needed to prove that things are not inherently produced is that the four are refutations of all possibilities of true production. Production is first either caused or uncaused. So that's your first thing you would say, right? Either you have production of things that is caused or it's uncaused. Well, uncaused is the fourth option that is in that uh, syllogism that we looked at earlier. If caused, well, then the cause and the effect are either the same entity, utterly different entities, or both the same and different? Is there a fourth possibility for being caused? Because <laughs> the other option is uncaused, you know, that there are no causes that lead to an effect, which is a preposterous idea. But anyway, we'll be looking at that tonight. But if cause, the cause and the effect are either one of these possibilities, and then the fourth possibility would be that they are uncaused. Thus, the possibilities for inherent existent production or production that can be found under analysis are only four. Production of an effect that is of the same entity as the cause. Production of an effect that is a different entity from the cause. And by different there, we do mean inherently different. Production of an effect that is both the same entity and a different entity from the cause. And fourth, causeless production, that things arise without any cause. Because the possibilities of inherently existent production can be limited when all possibilities have been refuted, inherently existent production has been perforce refuted, and the thesis of no inherently existent production can then be realized. So this is how Jeffrey Hopkins sets out what is involved in that uh, reasoning that we're going into tonight, beginning our analysis of diamond slivers. Since production from imputedly existent others is the only type of production, when production from other is refuted under analysis, this alone establishes that things lack inherent existence. Still, it is necessary to examine the problem of production from the viewpoints of the other philosophical systems, all of which can be included in those four modes that we just looked at. So what's being said on this slide, let me take it off screen for a moment, is when it comes down to it, when we understand how production actually does occur according to Prasangika Madhyamaka, they would say production occurs from something that is other, that is different than the uh, result. The effect and the cause are always different, but only nominally different. They are not inherently different. Right, because we can say, and we're going to use an example. This is brought up in the, later by um, Jay Garfield in the quotes I have it, of a seed and a sprout. And this is what's used in Chandrakirti, supplement to the middle way that we studied in Italy in terms of a seed and when it transforms into a sprout. Well, this is a seed is other than a sprout, right? If you went to the store and there were seeds and there were sprouts, you would know which one is which and you would identify them as quite distinct. You wouldn't get confused about what is a seed and what is a sprout because they are different, but they're only nominally different because that seed is in the continuum that eventually becomes the sprout. 
And when there's only a, some point in time where we delineate through our nominal designation that it was a seed and now it is a sprout, that seed has ceased to exist and sprout now exists, but seed doesn't utterly go out of existence because it is in the continuum of what arises into sprout. So we see that there is a difference between these two. We can say there is production from something that is other, that is different from the effect. But it is not inherently different, because if it was inherently different, production couldn't occur at all. So what was being said in that slide was that that would be the only one that we actually have to refute, is that there can be inherently existent uh, production from other or for something that is different. We don't have to pr refute production from something that's the same because that doesn't happen, right? Is the sprout that is produced from the seed the same as the seed? Well, no, again, there's a difference. We see that there's a difference conventionally. No one would say that, well, that we're gonna look at philosophical systems that do say this, but in general, you don't have the world saying that a sprout is equivalent to a seed. And what even the samkhyas that go into this, what they believe in isn't really quite that these are utterly identical. But anyway, we got to refute this because this is, as Jeffrey Hopkins says, one of the possibilities that we need to examine as well. The other one that is caused is by both same and different. Well, again, there's meanings behind that as to why they would posit something that is both the same and both different. But this isn't even what we see conventionally in the world, is that people see something that is utterly the same as well as utterly different, you know, that things don't have that ability to be both. And then when we talk about causes production, obviously we see in the world that things arise all the time from their causes and conditions. So we can't say that things arise without any cause whatsoever. So the other possibilities, the other three, arising from the self, arising from both self and other and other and arising causelessly aren't even seen conventionally we don't have any way of upholding them as possibilities so the only one of the four that we would ideally have to refute is that there is an existence from an inherently existent other something that is inherently different from the effect nonetheless as jeffrey hopkins says we have to refute all of them because all four modes are part of the realm of possibilities when we talk about them philosophically so it's necessary as he says here to examine the problem of production from these viewpoints of these other philosophical systems all of which can be included in these four modes of course the main one that other buddhist tenets would adhere to is production from inherently existent other which is the one again that uh, we would need to refute uh, as well. But there are other systems that refute those. So now I'm going to jump over to Jay Garfield's text where he, this is his translation of Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom. And the very first verse there says, neither from itself, nor from another, nor from both, nor without a cause, does anything, whatever, anywhere arise. By the way, I don't think this is the first verse of the entire text. It's the first verse of uh, second chapter, I believe, the chapter on causes and conditions. Anyway, the fourfold classification of positions, he says, with regard to the relation between an active cause and its effect is meant to be exhaustive. It has to either arise from itself, from something that is other, something that is both self and other, or without a cause. Then he goes on to say, but it is important to keep in mind that Nagarjuna was aware of philosophical schools espousing each of these four positions, and each of them has something to say for itself. If we begin by supposing a model of causation involving powers as essential properties of substantially real causes. The first view held prominently by Samkhya philosophers is that all causation is really self-causation. A proponent of this view would argue that for a cause to be genuinely the cause of that particular effect, that effect must exist potentially in that cause. In other words, the, the potential for the sprout must exist within the seed, or the, sp the sprout couldn't arise from the seed. So it's arising from something that is the same nature as itself, because that uh, sort of potential for the sprout to exist is within the seed. If it does not, the Samkhyas would say, then the cause might exist without the effect, in which case the cause would fail to necessitate the effect, in which case it would not be a genuine cause. You'd have this like disconnect between cause and effect. This is not to say that effects exist in full actuality in their causes, but that they have a genuine potential existence when their causes exist. Maybe again, some people in our world might adhere to this idea that there is something sort of inherently there that is the same as that result in the cause that is embodied in the cause that makes it sort of production from self. Secondly, 
causation from another is a more familiar way of thinking of causation and was the dominant doctrine of causation in the Buddhist milieu of which, in which Nagarjuna was working. On this view, causes and their effects are genuinely distinct phenomena. You have an inherently existent sprout produced from an inherently existent seed. And all the Buddhist schools below Prasanga Kamadhyamaka would say that that is how things are produced. <laughs> this inherently existent seed gives rise to an inherently existent sprout. They can be characterized and can, in principle, exist independently of one another, but they are related by the fact that one has the power to bring the other about. It can act as a cause for that following effect. Third, the doctrine of causation by both self and other emerges through a juxtaposition of the doctrine of causation from another and the doctrine of self-causation. So let us return to the example of the seed. A proponent of other causation might point out that seeds are not planted, watered, and that are not planted, watered, and so forth do not sprout. True. If you just have a barrel of seeds, a bucket of seeds, and no one ever puts them in the ground, gives them water, and uh, puts them in the, the sunlight where they will have the heat of the sun and whatever, they don't sprout. They need some other elements involved for that seed to give rise to the sprout. If the sprout were present in the seed, these other conditions, which are manifestly other than the sprout, would be otios, uh, meaning you know they wouldn't be of any use. Uh, on the other hand, the proponent of self-causation might reply, no matter how much you water, nourish, and exhort uh, an infertile seed, one without potentially existent sprout, nothing happens. So you have kind of both points of view that you need to reconcile. Somebody who was saying that this, this seed on its own requires all of the other conditions for it to um, arise. So it does depend upon other in that way. And then the others would say, well, but if the seed itself is you know, infertile and doesn't have any potential to produce anything, no matter how much you have those other conditions, those other conditions don't give rise to the result. So it has to be both self and other. You have to have the seed that is fertile, that has the potential to give rise to the sprout. And then you have to have the other conditions that help uh, ripen that seed into that uh, effect of a sprout. So all of the distinct conditions in the world will not suffice absent the potential existence of the effect. So the happy compromise doctrine that emerges is the doctrine of causation by both. Effects are the results of the joint operation of the effect itself in potentio and the external conditions necessary to raise the effects mode of existence from potentiality to actuality. You know, to bring forth from the seed, the sprout. But the, the sprout has to exist in potential, you know, within that seed so that it can then give rise when it meets with those causes and conditions. The fourth, the fourth alternative sounds so weird that things arise causelessly, but it says here, the fourth alternative view of causation is that things simply spontaneously arise from no particular causes, that there are no links at all between events. What might motivate such a view? Well, as we shall see, there are powerful reasons for believing that none of the three alternatives just rehearsed can be made coherent. And if one believed that only if there were either some identity or difference between causes and effects could there be a relation of dependency between phenomena, one would be forced to the nihilistic conclusion that things simply arise causelessly. I think this is held by what are called the charvakas, and they essentially point to things like the, 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 the mottled colors that appear on a butterfly's wing or, you know, various things in nature that they see that they, they can't explain any sort of causes behind this. You don't see anyone who's kind of creating uh, that potential uh, to arise and what have you. So again, they, they work with this idea, of course, in modern science, we've come to identify you know, DNA and chromosomes and all these various things that are the, the blueprint for what gives rise in terms of various characteristics, eye color and what have you, all these various things we see in the world. And we have you know, delineated it to an even greater degree, all the varieties of causes and conditions that uh, give rise to the diversity of phenomena that exist in our world. But anyway, we'll get into refuting them as well. So that's the background. <laughs> We haven't even started the verses yet for what we're going to be going into here in regard to this part of chapter nine, looking at the uh, diamond slivers uh, uh, reasoning. So let's go back to the slides and get into this in more detail. The very first of these we're going to look at is actually the last of the four that we just examined, refuting generation without cause. There's two verses for this. Sometimes, by a direct perceiver of worldly beings, all causes are seen, 
The divisions of the stems and so forth of lotuses are generated by the divisions of causes. If you ask by what are the divisions of causes created, they arise from the divisions of previous causes. Why are causes able to generate results? They arise from the very strength of previous causes. So essentially what Buddhism is coming out in refutation to somebody who says it's causeless is no, we do see in the world that there are causes and conditions that give rise to various effects. Let's look at um, what is said on uh, Gelsip J's commentary on page 63 for verse 116. Uh, and the beginning of 117, and then I'm going to go for the tail end of 117 to the slides and look at uh, what Abbot Dr. Gelson says. So in uh, Venerable Fetter's translation, he calls them the hedonists and others, which are essentially the charvakas, C-H-A-R-V-A-K-A-S, uh, or ayatas, A-Y-A-T-A-S is another name that they're given. Um, and they say, because one cannot see the products of the colors of the face on the wings of a butterfly and others, and one does not see any creator of the movement of the lotus petals or their smooth shape or the sharpness of thorns and so forth, therefore they exist out of their own nature. They don't have any causes and conditions that give rise to those particular characteristics. They must arise causelessly. Well, you know, it would seem that they would even still see that these things, you know, do arise uh, again and again from similar plants, from similar seeds, from similar uh, caterpillars in terms of the butterflies. So you would think that at some point they would kind of begin to examine, even in the world of nature, that things are arising from some respective causes and conditions, although uh, these patterns can't be necessarily discerned, someone making them. But Madhyamika replies in that way, essentially. It says here in uh, Gelsip J, this is invalid, the direct perception of of worldly beings sees most of the generating causes for the various inner and outer functionalities, such as crops and the like. The different results, such as the colors of the different lotus petals, their number and the like, are generated by different causes. And again, as I said, in modern botany and other research into various things, biology, whatever, they've shown how you can get down to the level of DNA and uh, whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying. I don't, I'm not a scientist, but <laughs> I play one on TV. Now, um, the idea is, is that we um, will see that uh, over time, they've been able to discern even to in a greater degree what gives rise to various causes occurring. And they can, you know, modify the DNA or whatever so that you get different results, right? We've seen this even in terms of uh, how they work with various things in science. So then the last sentence here, if it is asked by which different causes, then of course the preceding different causes, you know, just look, if you want to know what causes give rise to a corn field, well then look at the corn that is planted and the all the various things that give you know, are part of producing that, the watering, the, the sunlight, whatever, all the various things that contribute. Then it, the argument is put forward at the beginning of verse, um, uh, the rest of 117, why are different causes able to produce different results? So let me share uh, the commentary that I want to share with you there. That's that second, that second part of this verse, why are causes able to generate results? They arise from the very strength of previous causes. So Abbot Drakpa Gelson, he again, the ayatas or these charvakas say, why are diverse causes able to produce diverse results? The response from the middle way is there's no fault of inability because they come from the very strength of the previous causes. Since the causes are diverse, they are able to produce individual diverse results. So look at all the various, you know, seeds of different flowers. Well, they are able then to produce, uh, do, through their diversity, the diverse flowers that are the products of those, the effects of those causes. Therefore, the subject, these things, are not causeless. That's the fourth, again, of the, uh, this um, uh, four-point, uh, four-fold argument. Uh, these are not, they are not causeless because they are observed to be produced at certain places and times. When certain things come into play, then they are produced. When those things are not there, then they are not produced. They are dependent upon causes and conditions. And you might recall that, again, this is the very first level of dependent arising that the Buddha taught, is that things that are produced functioning things, impermanent phenomena, conditioned things, that they arise in dependence upon causes and conditions. And most of these we see in the world. 
again, the, in that day and age when they didn't have the ability to know what was going on uh, at a deeper level with the DNA of butterflies or whatever that gave rise to their patterns on their wings and things like that, then they wouldn't understand necessarily that where some of these phenomena in the world come from. But mm, there are causes and conditions to everything that is produced in our world. We see that that is part and parcel of why they are there. And the world witnesses that in regard to grosser phenomena all the time. I often use a vegetable garden as an example, right? If you have a little plot of land and you want to have a vegetable garden at the end of the growing season, you don't just keep looking out at your garden wanting the vegetables to grow and wondering, well, why aren't they there? Why am why aren't my, you know, why isn't there anything arising? Why don't I have vegetables at the end of the summer? Well, you have to do the, you have to put the causes and conditions in place. This is the very fundamental level of dependent arising that the Buddha speaks to. So this fourth idea that things could arise causelessly can be refuted fairly easily just through worldly um, experience. Now we go on to refuting generation from a separate permanent cause. This is kind of, you know, the idea that something that is other, but something that is other in a very unique way, something that is other in terms of being uh, a creator god, uh, such as Ishvara, again, which is what was held by the Vedic traditions at the time. Um, and then, of course, in our you know, modern day, or even, you know, in the history of uh, theistic traditions, we've had a creator God play a role in a lot of traditions. So we do have to look at this as a possibility, because many people adhere to this idea uh, in our world, that there is an, a creator God who is behind the scenes, who gives rise to the various effects, the things that we see in the world. So there are three bullet points within this. The very first of these outlines is refuting Ishvara with questions as to what is the meaning of Ishvara? What do you mean when you say Ishvara? What are we getting at here? You know, some of these arguments are kind of interesting, especially, I mean, I grew up uh, Catholic, so I have a theistic tradition behind me, and I always had issues with uh, theist theism anyway, so it kind of falls right in line with my own thinking, but anyway, not that I was this, you know, analytical when I was that age, but verse 118, if Ishvara is the cause of migrating beings, for the time being, let's just say, what is Ishvara? Say it, you know, what do you mean by Ishvara? What are you talking about as a creator God? If you say, well, he is the elements, you know, just it's that is the world that things are created from. Well, Buddhism would agree that all the various things that exist in the world are created from the elements. Why exhaust yourself even with respect to a mere name? Why would you call the elements Ishvara? It doesn't make sense. If it's if they're the elements, they give rise to the various physical things in our world. If <laughs> why do you need to call them Ishvara? Because if Ishvara is equivalent to the elements, well, the elephants, elements are doing fine producing all the things in the world. They don't need to be called Ishvara. So let's look at the commentary on that. This is on page 64 of Gelts of J. And here he's citing uh, the theistic traditions known as the Nayayika, the enumerators, or the Vaisheshikas, I think. Oh, no, the Vaisheshikas are the particulars, I'm sorry. And the Samkhyas are the enumerators, because they enumerate the 25 categories of phenomena. But there are some Samkhyas that are not theistic and some that are. I'm not going to go really deep into Samkhyas. We're going to get into them a little bit later tonight, probably. But just know that they're somebody we've encountered before. We did see them earlier in this chapter. Um, so these are all theistic traditions that existed at the time of the Buddha. And some of these still do exist. In fact, we had one gentleman at the master's program program who had become rather an expert on the Samkhyas and had gave us a little presentation on them. I can't say my head was much clearer on what their beliefs exactly are based on his presentation, you know, afterwards. Um, but nonetheless, he did a very good job of at least, you know, putting forward um, some presentation of what they believe in. But all of these theistic tradition, traditions say the all-knowing self-arisen Ishvara produced all places, bodies, and enjoyments with the preceding movement of his mind and is therefore the cause of migrators. Again, growing up Catholic, this sounds like, you know, God said the word and the word became flesh and whatever. I mean, all this stuff, you know, about how things are created, you know, through the mind of God over six days on the seventh day, he rested all these various things. I don't know. I think it's very similar, you know, the concept of there being some sort of theistic being who is behind the scenes, who gave rise to everything that exists in our world. Well, the middle way folks say, well, then declare what is posited as the meaning of Ishvara. And what do you mean by this term, Ishvara? Upon being asked that question, these theistic guys say, 
due to the increase and decrease of the four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, the results also increase or decrease. In the middle way say, well, that may be, although we also accept that from the increasing and decreasing of the elements, the results also increase or decrease. Why get strung out over a difference in name of the same meaning out of a great attachment to establish Ish Ishvara? In other words, why are you putting all this energy into calling that Ishvara when the elements, as I said, do just fine in producing the iterations of the elements, all the various things that arise in our world that are consisting of earth, wa uh, wind, uh, fire, and water, you know, so. Um, then it says, this is unsuitable because that Ishvara is unsuitable to be any great permanent or impermanent meaning is shown in the lines that follow, that begin with however. So we're going to get into a more detailed refutation of the concept of a creator god of this Ishvara. But we needed to first get from these folks, well, what do you mean by Ishvara? And if this is what they say is that, well, Ishvara is the elements you know, that have been produced and that give rise to further production. Well, However, since earth and so forth are many, all these various elements are many, they're, they're manifold, impermanent, they change moment by moment, without movement, not a god, and without mental movement, meaning they're not a god to be walked on and unclean, they can't be Ishvara himself. If you're holding this sort of this deity, this holy being as Ishvara, well, then how can you posit that that is what that God is, is these elements that don't have the same qualities that Ishvara has? Let's actually stop here. And I wanted to share, actually, you may be, have seen this even if you were using um, Stephen Batchelor's translation on the page where he introduces this whole section on, whoops, went too far there, on the uh, Nayayikas and Vaishashikas and the theistic uh, sham Samkhyas, they believe the cause of everything to be the god Ishvara. And they say that he has five qualities, namely divinity, he's this divine deity being, purity, being worthy of veneration, permanence, oneness and being the creator of everything by the way purity and being worthy of veneration to go together that's why it's, it sounded like six but there are five and then permanence meaning an unchanging nature oneness a unitary quality and being the, cre the creator of everything which of course is the big sticking point but obviously the other ones can be refuted too well if you're saying the elements are equivalent to ishvara well, then how are they divine, a deity? Uh, how are they pure when they're the very stuff from which, you know, feces and other things in, that are impure in our world are made of? How can those be worthy of veneration? They're changing moment by moment. They're not permanent. They're also manifold. They're m a multitude of things. They're not a oneness. And of course, they create things or are far involved in the creation of things, but they have no mind to create everything. You know, it's not the mind of the elements that makes various things arise. It is, again, in the, those theistic traditions that it's the mind, the movement of the mind of Ishvara that gives rise to the worlds that exist and all the things in them. So there are a lot of problems, a lot of holes that can be poked in this idea of Ishvara as it is set out. And again, whether these would all be qualities that uh, a theistic Christian, uh, uh, someone who's Jewish, someone who believes in other theistic traditions, is Islam, whether they would posit the same sort of qualities to Allah or Yahweh or God or whoever, I don't know, but I think there are some similarities. Uh, let's look at the uh, commentary on this verse uh, 119 from Gyaltsev J. That's uh, again on page 64, right in the center of the page. Because the four elements are in the nature of different substances, are impermanent, and producing generation and disintegration, are immovable in the sense of preceding the production of results with awareness, so they don't have any mind behind them that causes them to produce that, they're immovable in that way are not divine and the very ground that is walked upon, you know, they're the very stuff from which all the, you know, unclean substances of the world are produced. And be because they are impure, they are not Ishvara. You can't make that equivalent to Ishvara. You know, if that's what you say, well, we have a problem with that just because why give that name to the elements? Because things do arise from the elements. Yes, we agree. But if they don't have the qualities that you're ascribing to Ishvara. So how can you make that Ishvara? So it says, um, you know, they're, they're uh, essentially, you know, the, 
not equivalent. And so something else has to be put forward by the other folks, by these theistic folks, in order for us to be able to have any further conversation. So they come up with the idea that space is Ishvara. Well, Middleway doesn't like that answer either. Ishvara is not space. Space is sometimes called the fifth element because it is essentially the, uh, the non-existence of obstructive contact that allows all the physical things in the world to arise. And so space could be considered the fifth element because, and it can't be Ishvara. Why? Because it is devoid of movement. Again, it's not conscious. It doesn't have any awareness behind it. Space is not awareness. He is not the self. Somebody might put forward, well, Ishvara is the self. Well, he can't be the self. Why? Because that has already been refuted before. We refuted that back in verses 60 through 69. When we refuted, there was some sort of permanent, uh, independent uh, I that is the self. And that's, of course, how they're positing Ishvara. So how can that be the self? Third line, he is the creator who is not an object of thought. Well, sometimes I do hear this from Christians, even when they start talking, you start Needling, needling them a little bit about what do you mean by God? They say, well, God is inconceivable. God is this, you know, uh, inconceivable creator. Well, then the middle way reply is, well, what is the use of expressing that which is not an object of thought? <laughs> you know, it, 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 again, this gets to be tricky because we often talk about emptiness being inconceivable when it comes to the understanding of it at the deepest level. But nonetheless, um, I think we can still say that we can conceive, have a conception of emptiness that leads us to that non-conceptual awareness. This is a bit different. This is saying that, oh, well, this is an inconceivable being that is beyond uh, our possibility of thinking about them existing and what have you. So again, uh, this, this, I guess this was the frustration I often got from the parish priests when I would bring up points to them as they just say, oh, this is beyond your capability of understanding. Only God knows this. Only, you know, this omnipotent being has this uh, power or ability, what have you. So let's go through the three points that were raised there again. You know, um, first space is Ishvara, take the subject matter, or maybe there's, maybe there's only two points, I'm sorry. Space is Ishvara is the argument. Model, middle way says, take the subject space, space, it is not Ishvara. Why? Because it is immutable for the purpose of a result. A permanent self is, oh, there is a third one, that's right, the permanent self was being put forward. A permanent self is also not Ishvara, because this has been refuted earlier, both from the point of view of matter or consciousness. Again, we looked at that in the latter part of the verses uh, 60 through 69 in that um, first section that we went through. Be and then the argument is put forward, well, you, you don't, don't try to pin us down, because Ishvara is a creator beyond thought. So none of the faults that you are putting forward apply middle way, you know, we've got you beat, we've, we've you know, put out the uh, final answer that, you know, Ishvar is beyond thought, inconceivable. Well, the middle way says, what is the point of taking something that is beyond thought as the creator? In addition, you cannot know who Ishvar is as he is beyond thought. You know, so, so stop trying to posit this being that doesn't uphold with this structure of how things are produced. If things, we see things are produced from the elements, right? We do see that from uh, the earth element that is in the ground and the earth element that is in the seed and the water element and the heating element of the sun and what all these various things, all of these are, that what are involved in producing things. Well, this is how things come into existence. They don't come into existence through the force of a you know, inconceivable creator. So you're trying to establish this in a variety of ways, just doesn't hold water. So now we go on to a continuation of this on page 65, the next outline, if it is permanent, it is unsuitable to be the cause of anything arising from conditions. And remember that permanent in this context, we're going to see this kind of conflation a little bit later in one of the commentaries, but permanent here doesn't mean eternal, though with regard to a creator God, we would probably as ascribe that, right? Uh, when I was growing up, I was taught that God was eternal. He had this eternal quality of always existing and always will exist. But that's not the meaning of permanent in this context. Permanent here means unchanging moment by moment, lacking any momentary change. Impermanent means having momentary change. Now, again, things that are permanent sometimes do go out of existence such as the emptiness of dawn. <laughs> the emptiness of dawn will go out of existence when dawn goes out of existence, but the emptiness of dawn is un uncaused, it's unchanging. The emptiness is the same from now till now. It's, there's no 
changing of that, even though dawn, the phenomenon that is impermanent that we call dawn, does change moment by moment because this body is changing, the mind is changing, everything is changing that is involved with that being we know as dawn. But the emptiness of dawn doesn't change, but it does go out of existence. And it's an occasional permanent. So anyway, I'm just trying to point out that what we are talking about here when we talk about something that is permanent with regard to this Ishvara, that is a permanent cause for the things that exist in our world, there's a, there's a discrepancy there because we're talking about something that is unchanging, producing the world which is changing, the world which is impermanent, the world of caused phenomena. So it's unsuitable to be the cause of anything arising from conditions because this permanent being is it's a disconnect. How can you say that something is permanent gives rise to that which is impermanent? So let's go to that uh, second section of this uh, outline. I've divided this up a little bit based on the commentary in Geltzip J, the first three lines of verse 121. Also, what is, this, is that asserted to generate? Are not the entity of the self, earth, and so forth, and Ishvara also permanent? If you are positing a permanent cause, well then, you know, and it's kind of uh, upheld to some degree to be these various phenomena, they just spit out that, oh, the Ishvara is the self, Ishvara is the elements. Well, then that would make those things permanent. But well, we would have a discrepancy again, a problem. If we say that which is permanent creates something that is impermanent. So that which is permanent must only create that which is permanent. It's in the same nature of itself. Essentially would be the, the logical conclusion. Of course, that can't happen because permanent things can't give rise to other things in terms of uh, causal processes. But let's go to page 65. This will become a little clearer as we go through these first few paragraphs here. It says, if the feelings of happiness, suffering, equanimity, and other function functionalities are generated from previous karma and other causes, then what is the result that the Ishvara asserted by you desires to create? In other words, if we see in the world all these various things arising from their causes and conditions, then tell me again, what is it that Ishvara is creating? Because all these other things we see arising from their respective causes and conditions. The argument once more is put forth, it is the self. Well, the middle way says it follows that it is not valid because it follows that this self, the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air, and also subsequent similar types of Ishvara are not produced by Ishvara. If you say that, I mean, if they want to equiv make equivalent Ishvara to these three things, the self, the elements, uh, and any sort of continuity of Ishvara, you know, well then how is that creating those things? Because this is permanent over here. You're holding this to be permanent, but all of these things over here are impermanent. You know, well, I mean, maybe Ishvara isn't, but you know, a continuity of Ishvara that would be in this vein. Um, again, if, if they hold it to be permanent, it itself would have to be permanent, as would the elements, as would the self. So then it says, you know, they, again, they, uh, they are, um, they would have to be, okay, let me read this again. It follows that it is not valid because it follows that this self, the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air, and also subsequent similar types of Ishvara are not produced by Ishvara because aren't the self, the particles of the four elements and Ishvara permanent? Because again, if you have a permanent cause, and you're saying it's equivalent to these other results, well, then they have to be permanent too. Again, the whole structure of cause and result doesn't make sense when we start talking about anything permanent. Permanent phenomena cannot be causes. They cannot be results. You know, in fact, when we go through um, in the very beginning of Buddhist studies in uh, the monasteries, apparently, we studied this over in the master's program, what's called Dura, collected, collected topics. They delineate all the phenomena that exist. And in the category of everything that is impermanent, the synonyms with that which is impermanent or functioning thing are causes and results produce phenomena, composed phenomena. All of those things are equivalent because everything that is a cause is also a result. Everything that is a result is also a cause. Everything that is a cause is a functioning thing and is impermanent and so on. All of those things are equivalent on the one side. When you look at permanent phenomena on the other side, it's the non-momentary. It's things that aren't produced, uncomposed phenomena. Again, things like emptiness, analytical cessations, these sorts of things are considered to be uh, imper or permanent phenomena, meaning they don't change moment by moment and they are not caused. They are not a part of the causal process of how things come into existence. 
So the middleware response is simply saying, simply saying that these things would have to be permanent because they, you accept them to be permanent. Uh, they are invalid as that which is generated in the generator. They can't be cause and effect because cause and effect don't work in a permanent world. You know, permanence by itself belies the causal process. So anything that is a permanent phenomenon doesn't arise based on causes and conditions. Everything that is impermanent does arise on the basis of causes and conditions. So if on the one hand you have all that set that is produced by Ishvara that is impermanent and Ishvara himself being permanent, how does this happen? How does something which is permanent give rise to that which is impermanent? That which is impermanent arises from that which is impermanent. A moment of mind arises from a previous moment of mind. You know, a sprout arises from a seed. All those various things are in the nature of impermanence. Now let's go on to the next section. Uh, I put together a couple of lines here based on the commentary so we can better digest this next part. Whoops. Consciousness is produced from an object of knowing and beginningless happiness and suffering come from karma. What is generated by Ishvara? Say it. So essentially we're once more going back to this idea that all of these things that we know of and have an experience of have their respective causes and conditions. So what is, what, tell me again, what is it that Ishvara is giving rise to? You know, they have a hard time pinning down, well, how exactly is that process happening? And what is it that Ishvara is capable of producing? If they posit someone, a being that is permanent, unchanging, how can they, they be involved in a process of change and producing that which is impermanent? So the next paragraph then says, because the, I'm sorry, we we'll have to go up a little bit higher. It's the paragraph uh, about, yeah, little past halfway down. Then, because the different sense consciousnesses to which blue and so forth appear are generated from the objects of knowledge, blue and so forth. In other words, you have an awareness knowing blue on the basis of the object blue. That's how that arises. It's part of the causal process. Other factors are involved, obviously, too, but nonetheless, that's one of the main ones. And because the feelings of suffering and happiness are generated from virtuous and non-virtuous karma, respectively, well, not respectively, no, they put it in the wrong order. <laughs> virtuous gives rise to happiness, non-virtuous to suffering. Therefore, state the result that is generated by Ishvara. You know, show me what has been generated by Ishvara. Everything we point to in the world, a consciousness perceiving blue, the color blue itself, the uh, you know, results of happiness and suffering that we have that arise from karma, all these things have their causes and conditions. What is it that Ishvara is giving rise to again? The result generated by Ishvara simply does not exist. Again, that which is permanent cannot give rise to that which is impermanent. Impermanent phenomena arise from their respective causes and conditions. The rest of verse 122, if the cause does not have a beginning, as you are positing with Ishvara being a beginningless phenomenon, an eternal being, how could there be a beginning of results? How could, you know, wouldn't the results always be there because the being is always there? <laughs> because again, even though we did say that we're not equating permanence with eternal, in this case, you do have a being that is said to be eternal, right? Because even uh, again, in, in the theistic traditions and the Judeo-Christian tradition, you have, you know, the idea of, of God always existing. There was never a time when God didn't exist, and there will never be a time when God doesn't exist. So this eternal being, if he, he or whatever you want to call that being is the producer of the various things in the world. Wouldn't they always be there then by default, because that being is always there. You know, if they don't depend upon causes and conditions then they must be there all the time. So let's look at what is said by Gelsip J. Just one little paragraph on those two lines, because the causal Ishvara is a permanent functionality. If he were to exist since beginningless time, then how can there be a first of his resultant feelings and other results? The direct cause of the feeling generated today possesses its ability since beginningless time. You know, it would always exist if it existed uh, uh, as part of this permanent being that's known as Ishvara. I want to share a little commentary on that from Geshe Yeshe Topton's Way of Awakening. He says, the suffering we have experienced since time without beginning arises from specific causes, karma and mental afflictions. How then can we say that Ishvara is the cause that produces every phenomenon? And what is produced by Ishvara? Since both the happiness and suffering we experience are produced from our karma, again, our virtuous and non-virtuous karma, what does Ishvara produce? If he creates everything, then even the feeling we are experiencing now must have been produced by him. 
The suffering we have experienced since time without beginning arises from specific causes. Oh, I'm sorry, I went up instead of down, sorry. And since he has existed from time without beginning, then this feeling too must have existed from time without beginning. And the same would apply to the effect of our current feeling, you know, what arises on the basis of our current feeling of suffering or happiness. So again, this is the idea that if Ishvara, a permanent and eternal being, were the creator of all this, what he's created would have always exist. Since Ishvara is considered permanent and a creator, then everything produced by him should exist simultaneous with him. And it makes sense, again, if you take this to its logical conclusion of what they are calling this permanent being that creates everything. Then verse 123, and then we'll conclude for tonight because I think it's all we have the time for. Um, we'll get into 124 and 125 next week. Why would Ishvara not always create if he does not rely on others and there does not exist other that is not created by him? On what would that produce by him rely? It starts getting into the intricacies of how things are actually produced and the fact that we have kind of other conditions involved and in things coming into effect because somebody might say well there's other things involved in how you know ishvara gives rise to the various phenomena you know and only when those things are in place do we have these coming into existence so let's take a look at what um, gelsip j says on this at the bottom of page 65 he says, as Ishvara produces all results without depending on other conditions, why would he not produce all results on a continual basis? It follows it is like that, because if there is no other separate result that is not created by Ishvara, then in dependence on what condition does this Ishvara generate these results? Because if we say that he's the total creator of everything, well, then other conditions can't be involved at all. But we see, again, this belies what we see in the world that you know, it's only when certain conditions come into place that the seed gives rise to the sprout and so on. And you know, this idea that Ishvara would be able to be the creator of all of this um, in the space of what we see in the world just doesn't hold water. Then it continues, that asserted as simultaneously acting condition needs to be created by Ishvara as well, and it is acceptable that it is produced by him. In other words, both causes and any reliant conditions, any you know contributing conditions would have to be created by Ishvara as well. So he can't depend upon or rely upon other conditions to produce effects. It's kind of like, um, again, if we say that he's able to produce anything, you know, that Ishvara has this omnipotent kind of quality, well, then he produces everything. He doesn't need to produce the other factors that are involved to help produce something, because then he's reliant upon something that is other than Ishvara, that is produced, you know, separately, that gives rise then to all of this. Um, again, we run into some of these consequences. It's a shame we didn't have a time to finish this section off because we're going to get into that a little bit with verses 124 and 125 about if you are positing some mode of reliance involved in this, well, again, we're going to have problems because then Ishvara ceases to be this sort of independent creator. Yeah. If, if we're going to posit that idea that there's this thing being that has the complete power and potential to produce whatever needs to be produced, well, then it would have to be without relying upon anything else. So we wouldn't see any reliance upon contributing conditions and what have you. But those contributing conditions, if they do exist, would have to be <laughs> for the product of Ishvara as well. And so we run into once more, well, why would be the necessity of that when Ishvara can essentially create the finished product, doesn't have to even get involved in creating all the various iterations and things that give rise that are contributing factors. So we'll continue next um, week and uh, finish off this section and go on to talk a bit more about some of the other faults that we see. Uh, the Samkhyas, we're going to get back into them again because they uh, pr uh, put forward not Ishvara as a being, but this idea of a fundamental principle, a general principle from which everything arises, kind of like the, the soup of the <laughs> world that everything comes forward from, even consciousness and what have you, all these various things. So I don't know, it's kind of an interesting concept. As I said, I didn't really get all the intricacies of Samkhya, even though this one student there very skillfully <laughs> went through it all, but I don't know, it was a bit of a reach for me. But let's see if there are any uh, questions or comments on anything that I've said tonight. Uh, let's go to gallery so I can see everybody. Yeah, yeah, Fernando, please. I, I'm not sure whose hand was up first. I, I'll get to you in a moment, Richard. Yeah, please, Fernando. Yes. 
Okay, so it was in relation to our emptiness of inherent existence. I mean, it's supposedly that impermanent phenomena cannot cause permanent phenomena. Then when we are born, we are a cause or a condition for the emptiness of inherent existence of ourselves to appear, right? So we wouldn't we wouldn't ever use the term that we're a cause or condition for that. Because again, the emptiness is not a product. It's not something that is produced. It is a negation, a, a sort of a, a, a status with regard to everything that exists. It is the negation of inherent existence that is posited on both impermanent and permanent phenomena, on all phenomena. And so whether something comes into existence or not uh, through causes and conditions, uh, its emptiness does not rely upon causes and conditions. Okay, so then the emptiness of inherent existence of any phenomena is not a phenomenon, it's just the negation of that. It's, it's a phenomenon. Phenomenon is the largest category. We talk about phenomena, object of knowledge, existent, established base is another word they use frequently. That's everything that exists. That can be divided into two, that which is impermanent and that which is permanent. They are both called phenomena, impermanent phenomena, permanent phenomena. Impermanent are those which arise through causes and conditions. They are composed, they are causes, they are results, and so on. Permanent phenomena are those which are non-momentarily changing. They are not composed. And frequently they are negations, you know, like uh, uncomposed space, which is the absence of uh, obstructive conduct that a con contact that I mentioned earlier. That's a permanent phenomenon because it's always the same. Even when something's occupying this space, the lack of obstructive contact is still there. And uh, analytical cessations, which are when we have a cessation of obscurations in our mind due to realizing emptiness directly, those are also unchanging phenomena. You might look at them and say, well, aren't they caused by the mind realizing emptiness? The mind realizing emptiness does then have the, uh, the effect of, it, it, it removes those uh, obstructions, but the negation of those obstructions existing in the mind is what we mean by that analytical cessation. And therefore, it's a negation again. It's a cessation. It's the lack of something. Even when we talk about, and again, we can talk about very basic forms of negation, right? The lack of an elephant in your room right now. Every one of you doesn't have an, a live elephant in your room, right? <laughs> so you have a negation of that elephant. That's un an unchanging phenomenon, right? Yes. You know, it, it, there's, it doesn't change moment by moment. If you brought an elephant into my room, if I could fit an elephant into my room, maybe a baby elephant into my room, well then, you know, I could then posit that there's an elephant in my room and the negation of uh, the lack of an elephant in my room would cease, but it's not caused by the, you know, elephant not being there. It is a state of the elephant not existing in the room. And it ends when an elephant does exist in the room. I know it's kind of weird. It's you have to get your head around these permanent phenomena and these negations, but they are uh, again arising in conjunction with that which is produced. But that which is produced is its own continuum. The emptiness of that it has its own continuum on the basis of this negation existing. The negation of inherent existence with regard to Don came into existence when Don came into existence. It will kind of track through with Don as Don changes, you know, and through all the iterations of Don. And then when Don ceases to exist, the emptiness of Don will cease to exist. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. yeah, it does. I mean, it, it was just something that I was thinking, well, you mentioned that it cannot be created by an impermanent phenomenon, and I just wonder, you know, and then yeah. I'm going to burn, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, because we wouldn't say that it's created. We would say that again, that it exists, as a negation on a basis. And that basis can be impermanent, which again would be me, me or you or whoever, but the emptiness of that is not created. It's not produced. Yeah. Great, thanks, Fernando. Yeah, Richard. Um, hi, Don. Um, just, I just uh, didn't understand one particular sentence uh, okay. of Gelt of J on 64. And sure. when the argument is space is Ishvara, the um, the reply is take the subject space. It is not Ishvara because it is immutable for the purpose of a result. I just am having trouble understanding that. Um, I think again that we're referring to whenever he's using the term mutability or immutable, he's referring to the movement of the mind, kind of the changing of the mind to be able to produce something. So when we say that space is immutable, space 
Well, space too is a permanent phenomenon. It is unchanging, but it doesn't have the movement of the changing of the mind to be able to produce results. You know, from space, results aren't produced from space. Space doesn't have that motility, that ability to give rise to uh, effects. So that's how I, I read this, because it is immutable for the purpose of a result. Let me take a look real quickly. I often find brilliant wisdom, uh, the commentary that's in these two commentaries on chapter nine that His Holiness was commenting on in his book, to be a little more lucid at times. I will be sharing more of that uh, next time. This is verse 120. Let me read the um, section on space. Let's see. Let's here it is. Okay. He actually uses the term sky. I found that kind of interesting in this translation. This was translated by the Padmakara translation group. It says, Ishvara is the sky, you may say. Ishvara is not the sky because the sky is devoid of a creative mind able to produce a result. So that's exactly how he you know, said. It doesn't have that changeability of a mind that can create and produce various things from it. Neither is Ishvara the eternal self, for both the conscious self and the unconscious self have already been refuted. Da 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 kind of continues with that. But that was the only line then, because space is devoid of a creative mind able to produce a result. Okay. So it's it's a weird translation to say immutability, but it just means that you it, you can't have this conscious creation of things. That's what's kind of strange is when you talk about like if you talk about, I don't know again what terminology a modern Christian or a, a Jewish practitioner or whatever would use in terms of referring to God. But if they say that God is able to, through thoughts, create the world and what have you, well, then is that God permanent or impermanent? Because if it's permanent, then where do the thoughts come from? Because in impermanence is the only way you'd have any changeability, any mutability that could allow the thoughts to manifest in the way in the way of form, uh, in the way of creating the the heavens and the earth and the beings in the world and what have you. I don't know. So I think that's how it's being taken then. Okay. Thanks. Ah, uh, yeah, Fernando, another question, and then we should go. Oh, sorry, first. yes. I yeah. remember that once I heard that uh, Shantideva ended up having a confrontation with the Dirtika that was a devotee of uh, Ishvara. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up thinking, then, is Ishvara only a deva? And then that's why he could not help this practitioner that was following Ishvara. And then that's why, I mean, for what I heard, even Shantideva ended up helping this practitioner because they on, they went on flying to the stratosphere or nearby, and then he ended up saving this other practitioner so that he mm. would not die or something like that. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not really sure. I, Ishvara does come into play sometimes when they talk about the Deva realms, particularly the, I think it's in the, some of the form realms that you have these gods that they give ascribe Ishvara to one, but I don't, I don't really have the best recollection of this. But even if it's if it is a being that is ascribed to the world of sentient beings, but it's a deva within or a deity within that type of thing, well then again, how does that being play a particular role, and how is it even a being if it's a permanent, uh, eternal? you know, phenomenon or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure I can answer your question because I don't know the full story of that and, you know, where this Ishvara being is said to reside and is this Ishvara just a deity of the um, celestial realms that the Buddha posits or is it, you know, something beyond that? Um, again, if we think about Judeo-Christian terms, I mean, God is sort of seen to be beyond the world of ordinary beings, what have you, but is kind of everywhere at the same time, <laughs> you know, not existing in some sort of separate realm, but rather sort of this, you know, huge force within the world or what have you. I don't know. I'm just speaking off the top of my head here because, again, I never really got clear on the concept of God when I was a practicing Christian. So, but um, any final questions? I don't know. I don't know if that helped you at all, Fernando, with that question. I'll see if I can find anything out about that, that story. But. Yeah. Nope. Okay, good. 
Okay, we've got uh, ways to go to make it through to the end, but I'm, I'm going to do my best to get us there. So let's go ahead and do our prayers for tonight so we can make sure this merit that we've accumulated brings forth the greatest result, uh, dedicating according to the prayers that we normally use. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. And the prayers for our precious teachers as we recite these, by extension, think about all the other beings who are playing the role of spiritual guide for others, and we want them as well to have good health, long lives, and for us and others to never be parted from perfect guides in all our lifetimes. The wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining preserving and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Let's dedicate for any beings that we're holding in our hearts at this time, those that we know of or we've heard of who are experiencing obstacles to their well-being, who are experiencing illness, who are dying or who have died. Send this positive energy out to them so that they receive the benefit from it immediately, are relieved of their suffering, and find all the causes that will lead them to true peace and happiness. And may all beings find these same results through what we have done here tonight. Okay, thank you all so much. And I will yeah, get some homework questions and things. I haven't been able to have the time to put together meditations on all of these verses. I don't know when I'll get time to do that, but um, I hope that's been okay. I don't know how many people have used the meditations that I've put together anyway, but uh, just know that uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. And maybe at some point I'll catch up on that. But for now, I'm gonna work on just getting the questions so that you have those to work with. And then I'll get the slides as well uh, so that those get out there and you can use those but thank you all so much and it's good to be back with all of you and uh, look forward to the last four sessions working with this amazing text so all right be well thanks thank you. Good night, oh, you're very welcome thank you everyone good night everyone